Earlier, under the like uh, thought that a live performance is very introverted and like and you go into yourself, but mm -hmm. then I kind of with this band uh, more and more feel that it's kind of projected into the like having a dialogue and getting that back and feeling from there. Uh, I guess earlier I've been in bands where the music is kind of like uh, kind of different energies. Uh, yeah, with bass you know, it's somehow you kind of want to get like take that energy and kind of like just make everything slow up. Yeah. I saw you guys with Soul Street a while back and that was like the biggest thing that stood out was like utterly happy. So definitely you see that. Yeah, I mean that's like an early performance for us. So we we we've, we've been growing as a live band. And, uh, we, we, we were quite a new band at that time. I, I think things have been uh, evolving quite a lot between sort of recording the album and now. So I think you know doing a tour and stuff for us that was was a really good thing. We became a lot more um, kind of like the, the dialogue between the audience and the band. You know, got a lot stronger. We, we were understanding the crowd a lot more. But also it took, it took a while before our music to grow. You know, when we did those first few gigs and first few tours, it was like uh, you know not many people knowing who we were and, and we we're, we're not quite sure how to kind of uh, how how to uh, best sort of um, perform the music. So far as music influences, would you say some of your biggest artistic influences are? It's always kind of tough. Yeah, it's hard because I think you know, in terms of who I'm influenced by, it isn't really uh, necessarily how it comes out in the music. You know, so it's sort of like the difference between what your conscious influences are and your subconscious and I think with Beast Belt there's a lot of subconscious influences because the, the music was really like a channel like we're channeling something it was a channeling of a feeling from from sort of the the, the dark depression of the winter of living in this uh, this uh, the place that we live in uh, and coming, coming to terms with that and having this sort of like you know it's this kind of like feeling of uh, post-apocalyptic feeling that, that like you know the world, is, the world has ended and what are we going to do are we going to kill someone or are we going to kill ourselves and then we just decided to put that through that, that feeling through into music so you're really channeling a lot of uh, sort of subconscious things with, with your art that it's not really uh, it's not about hey let's, let's make a punk band or something you know it's just uh, it's a little bit kind of deeper than that I think the music that came out was, uh, was really like sort of a byproduct of, of, of a feeling like a conversation and, and really like a, a mood you know so um, I think that, that that obviously just then puts us in, in you know in a, in a category where we can kind of people relate to a, a post punk era band because that was the same vibe you know it was a time when things were happening politically there was a certain feeling a certain mood about people where they wanted to change things so you know you can sort of relate that back to a lot of what was coming out of the punk scene and I think that's the same with us we're sort of coming out of the black metal scene so we you know and, and a lot of different movements in music and, and our music is sort of like an evolvement from that so I don't know if it's like post punk or post punk you know, whatever people like to call it, but it's, uh, um... And our bass is the so... Yeah, yeah. 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 but it, I mean, you know, we're a killing joke, and these, uh, people, people like to sort of come and tell us what they think the 
music sounds like and what it's influenced by, and I'm quite really interested in that, you know. So, Lee and Joe, he's a good, you know, quite interesting band for me because I think they were they were incorporating a lot of different elements the same way we do. Um, you know, if you say something like Cure and Joy Division and stuff, those are those are obviously like for me, you know, vocally, uh, Mark Smith's like the influence, and then the Smiths as well uh, with the, the lyrics and, and and those sort of things. But you know, I don't sit down and think. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something like that. It doesn't sound like it's a conscious decision. No. Oh. Yeah, that's good. I think that's how it should be. It's to come from your heart. So far as your own personal preferences, uh, we're we're very interested in the personalities of the musicians we're going to be making. What was the first CD or band T-shirt that you really remember buying? That kind of piqued your interest and made you love the music that you love. I think it was a David Lee Roth t-shirt. I, I, don't, I don't think it was my first t-shirt, but I, I particularly remember Butcher of Birth being, you know, by Cannibal Corpse being a t-shirt that I really I really wanted to have to piss my parents off. I grew up, grew up in a Catholic household, so I was like, I was always really excited to see the, the, the t-shirts hanging on the clothesline, you know, like that was exciting for me because I knew that my parents were seeing them every day. I was reminding them, you know, like, they fuck off, like I don't, I don't, you know, the rebellious teenager thing, but I don't think that has anything to do with the kind of music that I ended up making. I just wanted to like, have the most offensive t-shirt I could. And then somehow they would always go missing. One would like eventually go missing, but probably the most disgusting one I had, I think I had was Fuck Your God, the Grail of Field shirt or something. And, and it, it, it was, you know, they'd go missing and I'd have to go buy them again. And my mom, I'd be like, okay, to my mom, I'm like, did you see that t-shirt? Oh, which t-shirt was that? Uh, and I wouldn't be able to describe it because, you know, it was like kind of offensive. So yeah, that's I said, you know, the one, the black one. No, I, I, you know, you have a lot of black t-shirts. Like, right, obviously, like, you know, somewhere along the line, she's just got rid of that one, you know, or something. I don't know, maybe they just really did get lost. But my, my whole concept back then was just to like, offend as much as possible. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, that I think of it, like, in two of my life, like, kind of, like, Somehow, the most important t-shirts were clip drawn, but had gone. Well, so I currently had a three t-shirt from my mother, then with girlfriend, because I was so like, obsessed about the band, and I was like, can you please like draw a, a shirt for me, and then she made it, and I still have it, but it's not that cool, it's really not it. Yeah. And another one is, uh, uh, that one is a shirt that made a lot of proof for me. And uh, because I don't think there still exists uh, official, official yeah. one. Yeah. No, no, so there's only yeah. like a hand drawn like on the first album cover. Something really special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys have any kind of guilty pleasures musically? Um, I, my guilty pleasure is any woman with a husky whiskey voice that sounds like Janis Joplin, but I don't say that very often. Yeah, I've got, I've got like a real soft spot for female singers and uh, I, I, I like that's kind of guilty because uh, my, my wife really hates generally female singers, you know, unless they're really good. Uh, and, and so because there's so many women who just you know, get up with the guitar and because they have this female voice, you know, they'll get a, a whole fall of guys, you know, interested in what they're doing. But I'm just a sucker for it, you know, I like, I really like female voice uh, in general. So I listen to like quite a lot of crappy music with a girl singing. I don't feel guilty for liking something. I'm pretty like I'm pretty shameless with what I listen to. I mean, I was before I came here, I was listening to uh, Nicki Minaj and Roscoe. So yeah. Hey, you gotta be proud. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't. I mean, if I like something, then I, you know, then I like it. I mean, it doesn't really. I don't care. You know, I shouldn't be like. It's good. I don't like it. Enough for me. Do you have any sort of pre-show rituals? Get ready for a performance? What are you going to do today? Yeah, no, we're, we're like uh, chewing the heads off bats or anything backstage or anything. You know, you know, sorry to like disappoint us, sort of, but yeah, of course, you know, you have warm-ups and things like that. Do you use anything specific? Yeah, I, I have a vocal warm-up. Exercises and stuff. Our, our, our drummer has something weird going on. He oh, always yeah. disappears. We have some like various theories about what he's up to. Yeah. He, disappears, but, uh, he has to have his own. He has to do, do his own thing. Like, he has his own space. So yeah. That's quite mysterious. Yeah, our theory is that he has like this secret photo that he goes and looks at photos <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I mean, we haven't seen the photo, but we're pretty sure he has one. 
Well, I want to thank you guys for taking this time to sit down and chat with us today. Do you have any last words for everyone? I'm going to get all excited. Sorry. <laughs>